So first I would like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to give this talk and to have a little bit more time to talk about the possible geophysical limits um, that we have for habitability on the one hand and also for the habitable zone. So first let's start with uh, possible geophysical constraints for long-term habitability um, compared for the Earth system and what we see on the Mars system. And here this is more about the um, habitability constraints for more complex life, like it evolved on Earth. And what you can see are here the geophysical feedbacks between the surface of a planet and the interior, like Earth, and how this compares to the Mars system. And one of the main um, geophysical factors on Earth is that we have plate tectonics and that we have subduction. So what happens is that the crust, the hydrated crust, is subducted into the mantle, which on the one hand leads to a large amount of volcanic outgassing, which feeds the atmosphere and therefore um, also the hydrosphere. But on the other hand, if you subduct the cold crust into the mantle, um, this leads to an efficient cooling of the mantle and also of the core. And an efficient core cooling helps to maintain a magnetic dynamo over long time scales. So the magnetic dynamo leads to the magnetosphere, which then on the other hand helps to shield the biosphere, but also the atmosphere from erosion. Now, if you look at the Mars system, which is um, in, compared to Earth as a non-habitable planet, um, there we don't have plate tectonics. We have only very limited outgassing to the atmosphere. We don't have a dynamo no shielding of the biosphere and of the atmosphere. <laughs> and um, this suggests that um, there are some geophysical factors that influence the habitability, at least on Earth, volcanism, plate tectonics, and therefore uh, related to plate tectonics also the existence of the magnetic dynamo. Now, if we talk about the habitable zone, we rather think about, well, actually, about one thing only, water. But I hope that at the end of the talk, I've convinced you that these three geophysical factors might also play a role for the definition of the <coughs> habitable zone itself. So we have already seen several pictures about the habitable zone before. Um, this is now an example calculated uh, for an Earth-like planet uh, based on limits um, that have been recently published by Koparapu et al. We've already heard this morning that there are different models uh, based on different databases. So it can well be that the habitable zone is a little bit uh, larger or shifted depending on, uh, on the literature values. But um, just take this as a reference habitable zone um, for, for this presentation. And this is now plotted based on these values uh, for uh, stars of a sun-like composition uh, for different masses. Here's a distance uh, to the star at one million years, so very young stars, and then how it changes after 4.5 billion years and after 10 giga years. So what we can see is that here in this upper region for the massive stars, the habitable zone strongly shifts with time, whereas down here for the low mass planets, the habitable zone stays more or less constant, and uh, we have a large continuous habitable zone down here. So, as we've heard before in this morning, the inner boundary of this habitable zone is mainly determined by water, which comes, for example, from outgassing from the interior or delivery from, by comets. But the outer boundary depends on other atmospheric greenhouse gases, like, for example, CO2. This morning, H2 has also been mentioned, but for if you look at um, terrestrial planets, um, small super-Earth planets, then it's rather CO2 that uh, we are looking at. And here, a very important factor is the outgassing and the build-up of a secondary atmosphere that stays over long time scales um, to be able to get the maximum greenhouse effect right here at the outer boundary that has been mentioned this morning. So this is a very nice picture that is regularly updated from PHL, showing the potentially habitable planets that have been discovered so far. And meanwhile, so this is from January this year, we have a lot of uh, potentially habitable planets. So potentially habitable means here only that um, these planets are in the habitable zone, 
um, calculated for, as Mareike said this morning, a planet that does exactly what you want it to do, that can outgas as much water or CO2 as you want it to have. Um, there are some challenges for the habitable zone. Some have been mentioned already, but just as a summary, so one is that um, the atmosphere actually might not look like you need it to look like. Another point is that the habitable zone is typically only shown for one example state, an example age, an example planet mass, example star composition, and it might actually vary with these factors. Um, then, if you talk about habitable zone, well, there's another habitable zone outside of it, where we have liquid water in the subsurface. So this is also something that you should not forget. Um, also, life might use a different solver than water. So this is just when we look for an Earth-like planet or for, for Earth-like life that we actually should look for water. And then there are other constraints needed for the habitability. The availability of nutrients has just been um, discussed before. Also, the availability to energy and the building blocks of life in general. So there's a discussion poster about this, and I invite you all to come visit um, Arcus and me this evening. It's a poster session to discuss about this. So here it's, I want now to talk more about the characterization of exoplanets and the geophysical constraints um, depending on the characterization. So first, it has been mentioned um, before also today that um, just if you know the, the density, the average density of a planet coming from the mass and the radius of the planet, that you do not really know what the planet looks like. So here, for example, um, there are two different interior structures shown for a planet of one Earth size and one Earth mass, where on the one hand, we would have an um, Earth-like iron core and an Earth-like silicate mantle, compared to a planet with a much larger iron core, a very thin silicate mantle, and a large amount of water and high-pressure ices on top of it. Of course, also the composition of the silicates and of the core could vary as well, which would also lead to different possible interior structures. So this is why we typically look at a diagram like this, where we plot the radius of a planet over the mass of the planet. And what you can see here is that we have two broad regimes. Uh, one regime with a low density, average density, um, which indicates that the planet probably has a large amount of water. And then another area, which is this chest pattern area here, which means that this can actually both <coughs> be rocky planets and water-rich planets. So just the example that I showed you before, for one Earth radius and one Earth mass, can already be an ocean-like planet or a terrestrial planet. So let's now concentrate only on the terrestrial planet. If you want to model the terrestrial planets, depending on an assumption of the interior structure, we typically limit ourselves um, to a differentiated body. So we have an iron core, which can be partially liquid or entirely solid, for example. The silicate mantle and some kind of a crust, which can be like a basaltic oceanic crust or continental crust, like on Earth, for example. What is very important is to model, actually, the mantle, because there, <clears throat> when um, hot mantle material from the core mantle boundary rises upwards, at some point, pressure release melting occurs, which means that some of the minerals in the mantle mixture start to melt and are um, extracted out towards the surface. However, it's typically not that the all of the material is melting. So this is why we use um, this word depletion of the material. So if we have partial melt, we partially deplete the mantle in, um, in melt, which is rising to the surface. On the other hand, um, not all of the melt that is rising towards the surface is actually extracted to the surface via volcanism. So we also have intrusive uh, magmatism. And if you want to look at the evolution of an atmosphere, of the secondary atmosphere of a planet, then we only have to look at the extrusive melt. However, it gets a little bit more complicated, and um, there's a problem which is called the density crossover. So first, just uh, look only at the blue lines here, um, which are the density of um, olive oil, which is um, the main upper mantle material of Earth, over pressure. And what you can see is that if you compress the mantle, if you add more pressure to the, to the material, then the density increases with depth. 
Now, in red is shown um, two example melts in Martian analog melt at 1,800 degrees Celsius and in Peridotor, it's a primitive earth mantle material mixture. And here you can see that the density is actually increasing much steeper with pressure because liquids can be more easily compressed. So when you actually have melting up here in the corners, in the shallower region of your planet, then the melt is rising upwards and you get volcanism. But if you have, for example, six stagnant lid and you have melting beneath, which can easily occur, the melting does not rise upwards anymore. You don't have a buoyancy anymore. So you don't see any volcanism in this case. So this is important to keep in mind because I will come back to this later on. So let's now um, have a look at a simple Earth-like case, so planet of one Earth size, of one Earth mass. But let's ignore plate tectonics just for the moment. So just assume that we have a stagnant lid on top of the planet. Here you can see the evolution first of the temperature and then of the mantle depletion over time. So a higher depletion means that more melt occurred and more outgassing appeared. So you can see that depletion occurs in the uppermost part of the mantle beneath a stagnant lid. Uh, material is um, going outwards. And via convection, the depleted material is convected downwards. And so at the end, you have a homogeneously mixed mantle underneath a non-depleted lithosphere. So now what happens if you have a different interior structure? So now we just look at the planet of fixed one Earth radius, but different masses, so higher density or lower densities. So looking on the one hand of an interior structure like we have it for Moon, and going to an interior structure like we have it for Mercury, but fixed for the size of Earth. And what you can see for this case, because iron, the iron core is much smaller, actually the pressure gradient up here is smaller, which means that you can have melting until deeper levels where you still have the buoyancy effect. And therefore, at the end, after 4.5 billion years, your mantle is well depleted, um, especially compared to the Earth-like case. But if you go now to a case where you have a very large iron core, this uh, black line here is where the density crossover appears. And this is already shifting into the stagnant lid that forms due to thermal conduction. So actually, for this case, you have no partial melting at all that rises up to the surface. You have no volcanism at all. So here you can see the average uh, mantle depletion values over the radius ratio. So that means the ratio of the core to the planet radius. So for this rather moon-like case, we can see that we have um, high values for the average depletion and partial melting um, for independent of the temperature that we use. And with increasing core size, the mantle depletion um, decreases uh, down to zero. Now, if you look at how much CO2 we actually outgas into the atmosphere, one can see exactly the same trend. So for planets with a core radius of about 70%, um, 75% already, we don't get a secondary um, atmosphere which, which is larger than maybe 0.1 bar CO2. <coughs> So um, what I didn't mention, or let's, let's come now to the case of plate tectonics, because um, here we assume three different cases. Again, the, the Earth-like um, interior structure up to the Mercury-like interior structure, where we now assumed very slow values for, for the um, fraction coefficient that we force the planet to go into plate tectonics, even if it wouldn't um, go itself. And what happens then is that the second that you have plate tectonics initiating, the outgassing of the CO2 is shooting up. So over time, even for the cases where for the stagnant lid cases, you didn't have any partial melting and outgassing at all. If you initiate plate tectonics immediately, you have several tens of bars of CO2. So the outer boundary of the habitable zone is safe. Um, of course, then there's a question, how likely is it to actually have plate tectonics for cases um, like this Mercury-like case, for example? And I just want to go shortly into this, that there is the maximum of likelihood for a radius ratio of something like 0 0.7. So for planets that have a slightly larger core than on Earth to actually obtain plate tectonics, but it's um, decreasing um, again for larger cores 
and it's also only short time um, plate tectonics that you would actually obtain. So let's now look at the planet mass and how it influences the habitable zone. Um, there has been a paper last year showing that the interior uh, boundary of the habitable zone actually depends on the planet mass. But we want to know now if also the outer habitable zone maybe is influenced by the mass. So here we have again a reference case of an um, Earth-sized um, planet. Also, we only um, use for now Earth like interior structures. And if you go to smaller planets, like a Mars size and Mars mass planet, this average depletion goes to a very high value of about 25% in this case. You have a lot of outgassing, a very dense atmosphere as possible. However, if you go now to the very large planets, again, we have the case that we cannot expect much of mental depletion because the pressure is very high just in the upper, upper area. Um, if you would have plate tectonics, you would expect a little bit more of outgassing, um, but this is highly discussed for this large mass of super-Earth if plate tectonics is actually possible or not. So here just to sh uh, show that the average depletion goes down even for planets around um, that just few Earth masses. Um, and the same, of course, for the outgas CO2, um, that you cannot expect um, a lot of outgassing if you go to larger mass uh, planets, if they are stacking lit planets. And um, if you compare you know, the two studies of having different core sizes, but also different planet sizes, here, up here you have um, the rather small planets up to one um, Earth mass, and um, the average depletion is always very high, independent of the iron core, of the core radius. However, if you go to more massive planets, to larger planets, then you always end up in this area independent of the interior structure, where you have almost no outgassing, as long as you don't have bad tectonics. So what does it mean now for the habitable zone, if you cannot expect an atmosphere of more than, let's say, 0.1 bar? Well, it actually gets quite thin. So if you now look at the continuous habitable zone and just look at this area up here, there is no continuous habitable zone anymore. It's different for the lower mass planets because the, the habitable zone is more stable because the star evolves over longer time scales. So to summarize the geophysical constraints for the habitable zone is first we just look at terrestrial planets of up to 10 Earth masses and two Earth radii. Um, large mass of planets are less likely to outgas dense enough atmospheres for the outer boundary of the habitable zone. A high iron content also leads to less likely um, outgassing. Plate tectonics can change the picture and may also be needed on the one hand for the long-term climate regulation like we have it on Earth and also for the magnetic field that we need for the uh, maintenance of the dense enough atmosphere. So just very fast, if you look again at this picture of the current <coughs> exoplanets, a potentially habitable exoplanet, if you look at which of these planets are more potentially than the others, we can first have a look at which of these planets are actually really terrestrial planets, so less than 10 Earth mass, less than 2 Earth radii. And there are already several of the candidates drop out. Now we have seen that this large mass of planets are also less likely to have a dense atmosphere. <coughs> so if you cross out all of these planets um, with more than five Earth masses or 1.7 Earth radii, most of the other planets actually drop out. <coughs> so this doesn't mean that the other planets are inhabitable. Just looking at the most likely, most potentially habitable exoplanets, we end up with these candidates. Then looking at the uh, problem of the continuous habitable zone. So which of the exoplanets will have inhab be in a habitable zone for really long time scales, like 10 billion years? Then it's again more planets that drop out. So we end up with actually six highly likely potentially habitable planets. So now let's look at if we know the, actually the density of these planets, because if we know the density, we can say more about the potential of um, outgassing dense enough CO2 atmospheres. And the problem is that for all of these six candidates, we only have the mass or the radius. We have no idea what the density is. We have no idea what the interior structure is, if they are terrestrial planets at all. We don't know it. 
but we can actually look at where these planets are situated in the habitable zone. So even if one of these planets has a very large iron core and probably just a very thin, maybe one more CO2 atmosphere, it would still be very likely habitable if it's close to the inner boundary of the habitable zone. So if you actually look at these candidates, we end up with two highly, highly, highly potentially habitable planets. The problem is now, and these are just my last words, this candidate over here, GJ667C app, um, there's a new paper in press right now, doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> the other planet, Tau CTE, there's one paper that has suggested that it could exist if there is a configuration of four stars explaining exactly the radio velocity measurements. But there are also explanations with five, six, uh, five planets, six planets, seven planets. So there's no idea if this planet exists or not. So these planets might all be habitable, but if you want to look for the really, really good candidates, then we have to look into the future to test GEOPS and the other um, missions. Okay, so this is I would like to say. Thank you very much.